Hi, this is Phil Spencer, and you're listening to the Inner Circle Podcast. For the fans, by the fans. Thank you for listening to the Inner Circle Podcast, the premier podcast for Xbox. Today we have with us Seamus Blackley. To some of you, you may know him as the father of Xbox, but to us, we are really going to try to get deep down and try to understand what his life has been like in the industry as a designer for Microsoft and try to get to the nitty gritty for your fans. So first and foremost, I want to thank you, Seamus, for coming on the Inner Circle um, and giving us the opportunity to talk with you. I'm very appreciative of that. Hopefully you'll be able to give us some sort of great history on Xbox and figure these things out. So my first question to you is, how did you guys come up with the original concept for the OG Xbox? Uh, uh, well, all right. Thanks for having me on, and thanks for setting the bar so low, dude. Because that's great. So it's, it has to be amazing <laughs> and obvious, and obviously we gotta amazing. work our way right. up. We gotta work our way up. I'll figure out. Okay. All right. So I'll, you know, so, so we'll start low. Uh, Xbox. So the Xbox is a kind of accidental. You know, more than anything else, uh, it probably it probably got its inception with the complete and abject and utter failure of a game I designed called Trespasser, which was supposed to be a game sequel to Jurassic Park. And uh, basically, um, I bit off more than I could chew. I had this big team. It was the first big physics-based game. I mean, there are a lot of people who still love this game. It's got a lot of fans still. But at the time, uh, it was right at the dawn of Internet fandom, and we were late. And the company is releasing a DreamWorks with new to games. And... We had a deal with AMD or somebody, I can't remember, where we would get a big kickback of money if we released by a certain date. And as you guys know, uh, a late game is only late until it ships, but a bad game is bad forever. Right, right. And so we made the mistake. I was like 26 years old or something. I got pushed into shipping it before it was done. So I got death threats. I got people coming to my house throwing <laughs> rocks at me. Like, it was craziness because people were really excited about it, and it had a lot of promise. And it probably would have been great if we'd finished it. Um, and I thought my career is over. And during the course of working on that, um, because one of the investors in DreamWorks had been Microsoft, um, I had a chance to show all the technology to Bill Gates. Uh, we had the first ever real physics system in a game. We had the first ever, uh, you know, dynamically uh, animated, like procedurally animated animals and stuff. So uh, you could, you know, throw things at a dinosaur and it would fall over and trip and stuff would drop off of it and things that people expect today but back then this was like moon rock shit this was like crazy uh and it, it made audio based on the physics system and again it's all stuff that seems you know like very very common today but this was really the first time around for it and it was it was hard and we were trying to do it all at once right but it really impressed bill gates and so he had essentially like somewhat jokingly offered me a job <laughs> so i thought all right my career is over i'm going to be killed by some random gamer on the street <laughs> 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 Like, I should maybe escape to Seattle. And uh, so he made good on the promise, and I went up there to be program manager of Windows Graphics, which basically meant uh, that I was in charge of making sure that Windows Graphics, uh, you know, stayed as leading edge as they could and were always good for games. And so I got the whole roadmap from all the video card manufacturers, the roadmap for what DirectX was going to do in graphics and sound. And around that time, like literally weeks into my being up there, you know, figuring that my life was over. I, I was like, literally, I was, I was like, so this is all I've ever accomplished and I'll just end it here, man. And it's going to be cool. And just being my dog. I was like really in that state. PlayStation comes out with this announcement that the PlayStation two is going to be more powerful than any PC. And it's going to replace the PC. And in fact, it's going to have Linux on it. And they showed, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember if you're not old men like me, <laughs> but they showed PlayStation twos with like keyboards attached to them. And stuff. no, I didn't know that. <laughs> and, yeah, and um, but you can you look into this and don't learn. <laughs> and so you know everybody at Microsoft freaked out, and like lots of people came to me uh, because I was a pretty high guy in Windows, and I had worked in games. And I was like, "Well, this is complete bullshit." You know, it's just that no no one knows because of the nature of the PC platform how powerful our graphics is going to be. Mm. Because we have a couple of problems. First of all, we have an economy 
as opposed to a device. So we have a whole bunch of companies working on PCs and hardware all in parallel, tied together by the Windows platform, which means that every different PC is a little different and a little different performance. And so it's hard to point to what the performance of Windows is. Um, and so, you know, if we, you know, if we, we, we like look at the roadmap of what's coming, we're going to be way more powerful than PlayStation. Plus, the most important thing is all the tools people use to make content are on the PC, right? So people working on Sony games are using a PC to make the game on PlayStation, right? Because that's where 3D Studio is and, you know, and, and the tools that people are using at that time. Right. So for artists and people who make games, you know, we had this great platform. So I, uh, I was on a flight to visit my girlfriend who was living in Boston at the time. And uh, I had just ordered a new laptop for myself. And, and if you want to know the sort of like outrageous, callous dick that I am, um, I was so excited about the laptop that I had it sent to my girlfriend's house so I could get it over the weekend when I was supposed to be visiting her. And she, was, she was like, she was not impressed by this move. So it was like locked up and like handed to me on the way out the door to the airport. Right. And so I get this laptop and this is really still sort of early internet days. Uh, and I get on the plane and of course there's no internet on the plane and I have nothing to do. But I want to screw around with my laptop. And so I start to think, all right, look, um, how could we, what could we do to sort of blunt this PlayStation announcement? Well, the thing that kills the PC is that there's no, like, single hardware spec that allows all this technology to really, like, work together and kick the crap out of a platform like PlayStation. And you could bring all the tools to bear on it. So by the time I landed in Seattle from Boston, I had this plan for, like, a Windows game console. Um, and so I, I call up my friend, Kevin Backus this is like, you know, at one in the morning and I like, I, I gushed to him. I'm like, we can do this. We can do this. We can do this. And we're going to win because we have the tools. We have the developers and everybody <laughs> likes to use it and better hardware. And we have the direct X pipeline and we have all these different companies and they can work together and we can and blah, 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 blah. Right. And he's like, what the f are you talking about? Um, but I, I kept on pushing and, uh, you know, found a small group of friends and the guys on the DirectX team. And we made a specification for essentially a Windows game console. And we didn't know what to call it, so we called it, uh, we, we, it was gonna run on top of the DirectX graphics technology, so we called it the DirectX box, mm. a box that ran DirectX. And that's where Xbox came from, is a, is a shortening of the name. So there you go, that's way more than anyone ever wanted to know, but no, no. no. context, and you can look up Linux on PlayStation 2. And, that's a, feel, and, I, and I feel now that I've given you some enrichment. That's amazing history. That's, fun. that's great history. A lot of people d honestly don't even know that. Like the, that, that's really what inspired um, the, the Xbox, how that inspired the Xbox to come about. Because um, a lot of people look at it differently, but it was really like the attack that Sony launched onto Microsoft um, with the PlayStation 2. It, it's like they came out of the gate aiming for that PC gaming market. They, they, they really had, like, these eyes that, on them. I don't think that they were looking for the PC gaming market. And the PC gaming market at the time was, I don't think, maybe something that they really thought... People didn't think about things the way they do now with respect to Windows games and, and PC games and console games. It was a little bit different. Um, I really think that Sony was looking for credibility. They were talking about replacing the PC because they were using that as a way to talk about how powerful the cell architecture was, the CPU architecture on PlayStation 2. And so, so they, boasting. you know, and, and well, and specifically in Japanese culture, you know, Windows was held in very high regard. Far after Microsoft was hated and mocked in America, <laughs> in Japan, Japanese people thought it was awesome and amazing. Um, I used to actually go around shopping, like with the the head of MSKK, with Jap the head of Microsoft Japan, and like you'd go, we would go to like you go to a or somewhere, like, a, like you know, kind of like a fries, and they'd recognize him and send like shoppers to carry his bags and stuff. Like that's how respected Microsoft was, and so Sony was really trying to talk about how powerful their architecture was when they said that it was going to replace the PC and that it could do the same things as the PC. And what they didn't understand was that they handed me and my friends the ultimate weapon because Microsoft was deadly serious about not having that position in the economy of computing taken away from them. And so Sony, I think, un kind of unintentionally woke a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
And it, it's <laughs> it's funny that you say that because when I think about a lot of things that I read from Xbox history was always about Bill Gates wanting Windows in every home and the decision to go with this console based platform instead of going with this PC based platform because the loading times were so significantly different. No, that's just so. So that's all. That's garbage. I mean, really, all that is. Yeah. All, you know, look, people. People make stuff up because it sounds reasonable in the time in which they live, mm. um, and this is this is this is the the problem with writing history. Right? Is to to really understand history, you have to be able to put yourself in the mindset of the people living at the time you're talking about. Right. And you know, the time we were talking about, game consoles weren't cool. Um, gamers were considered to be criminals. <laughs> um, you know, console gamers especially. Um, when you if you made games, you weren't cool. I mean, it was really just the dawn of nerds being cool. Right. You know, when I went to high school, if you had aptitude for computers or math, you would literally get your ass kicked. Literally. Not not even tongue-in-cheek. Nerds weren't cool. Nerds were assholes. Like, genuinely. Right. And it, it's really only now that they're not. And so, But you can't look back at that time and think that computer game designers were cool in the, you know, mid-90s. Because they weren't. You'd say, people would say, what, what do you do? And you'd say, I make... I, I make video games, and they would say, "What? <laughs> isn't that isn't that in Japan or what? People make those? Right. Why would you waste your time making a game? Right. Um, on uh, on Trespasser, I remember the the voice actress we hired to to play the main character was Minnie Driver, and we were talking while we were doing some recording, and she said, "So what's your background?" And I said, "Well, I was a high energy physicist." And she looked at me and she said. Why are you wasting your life on games? Wow. Oh, my God. Wow. Completely astonished. Uh, she's like, why don't you do something good for society? Um, and what the hell do you say to that, by the way? Right. Anyway, yeah. The yeah. great thing was, like, two days later, she was dating Matt Damon, and he broke up with her. <laughs> on <Earth. Yeah. laughs> and I was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, I love your movies now. <laughs> and, and Minnie, if you're listening, I'm sorry. We were young, whatever. We didn't know what you were saying. Anyway, but um, the, uh, uh, I mean, the upshot is that, the, that, that Microsoft didn't want to do a game console or anything. You know, they'd always been thinking about the living room. They had purchased Web TV, which was a company that was supposed to put web access onto cable boxes. And really... You know, the people running Microsoft were not in any way plugged into games. Mm. I mean, we were total space aliens to them. And games were not seen as a thing you could use to win the living room. Cable boxes were the way you could win the living room. And in fact, a lot of our battle getting Xbox greenlit was to help the executives make the decision to put money behind a game console instead of a cable box. Wow. Because they really literally had no idea that a game console could be more exciting than a cable box or that a game console could act as a cable box. And so... Like when you when we saw 360 with its cable box functionality, I mean, no one was laughing as hard as me because I know exactly where that came from. Right. Wow. Now uh, I remember um, about that whole cable box thing. Uh, what, what was that called again? I remember it was like it wasn't an MSN something. Well, it, there it, there was Web TV, and there was you know obviously MSNBC, and there was MSN and. That was the that was the internet service, right? I, I, re I remember seeing that, and but I, I was surprised with how long they supported that. They they supported it for so long. Well, um, I mean, once you have a bunch of people signed up to a service, it's like how long did AOL last? You know, and and you guys probably again, you're too young to to realize how silly the whole thing was because mm -hmm. everybody's dialing up, and most of the people who dial into AOL thought AOL was the internet somehow. They'd be confused about right. It. Um, and, and like, and if you wanted to send email to somebody on AOL for a long time, you couldn't unless you were also on AOL. Right. It was like you know, the, it was like the phone system in Bangladesh where like there are three companies and their phones don't connect to each other. It was <laughs> oh crazy. My God. That's that's. Crazy. Um, so uh, so, you know, it was it was just a, it was a different time, and and Microsoft had a bunch of different plays in different places, but you know, the big business was the, the big business was Windows, and the big business was Office. And the idea that games were a big business was totally alien. And so we spent a lot of time talking to people about how big the game industry was and how fast it was growing and how passionate gamers were. And what ended up really working for us was as the executives of Microsoft and as Bill Gates and Ballmer had more exposure to games, they realized, my God, there's this whole world of these super passionate technology customers out there and we got nothing for them. Mm. And that really helped us to sell the to sell the idea. 
I mean, ga- gamers are really responsible because, you know, once everybody got past making fun of me that we would have a console that would, like, have the blue screen of death. And, and here's a funny one. You ready for this? You know how much I took about, uh, about patches for games? Because PC games and software had patches, and consoles never had patches because it was spinning media, right? You get a disc. Right. Yeah. People would be like, you're going to have a console that has patches, and that's going to suck. And aren't, aren't I laughing now? <laughs> I, I remember I got my PS4, and I plugged it in, and I couldn't play a game for like an hour and 40 minutes. You know, as it was like updating itself. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I have like an internet connection where like, you know, when I turn it on, the power in the city of L.A. browns out. Like that's so <laughs> fast and that didn't even matter. Wow. <laughs> wow. But so much shit over Blue Your Depth that I actually had in my stock, like the slide deck that I would go present at different like game companies. Like I go present at Activision or something. Nobody, because I was going, I'm like, yeah, Microsoft's going to make a game console. And people would just start laughing. Literally. And so I just I just made fun of myself. I, I, I actually had my slide presentation pretend to blue screen halfway through. See, and I was gonna see um, that that that's something that they gave you a lot of a, a lot of crap for. So I was wondering, um, with, with the Xbox, did they give you a lot of crap too for the Duke? Oh yeah, of course they did. Yeah, no, I mean like like seriously, <laughs> like like un- unbelievable amount of crap. Like people genuinely come up to me, and 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 they would say. Like, you're an idiot. You must have no idea about how things work because you've made a controller the size of, like, Michigan. And I, I just look at them. I'm like, you know, and the whole, like, the, 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 the unbelievable amount of work and effort and organization required to, like, launch a console. And I'm thinking, you know, this fucking controller, <laughs> like, we're getting this done. The controller is going to be okay. you got to relax. Um, but, yes, I took... I mean, really, an unhealthy amount of crap over that controller, right? That, which was crazy. <laughs> hey, but you, gave, you gave us one at the very least, and uh, I mean, they, they can't give you crap for that. Um, so, look, uh, since, since mentioning this, no, I think it's fair. I think it's fair game. That controller is epic. That controller is huge, dude. Like, it needs a tug controller to dock on your counter. I mean, it's crazy that thing. <laughs> and and uh, but you had not that long thereafter. You had the. Uh, the S model come out, so you guys didn't. At least you did something about it. Something out it. Uh, it was addressed, is what I'm getting at. Well, yeah, I mean, there there was God. Like you, you know, when you, even if you run a big organization, you don't necessarily control a big organization, right? Um, and you can't just tell people to do stuff. Uh, and you guys know this. Like, but for some reason, a lot of times when people think about a big company, they think about it like you know. Like, it's General Patton in World War II, and you just, like, tell a guy, go take that hill, and if everyone dies, I don't care, and they just go die. Mm. And, of course, it's, that's completely absurd. Like, not only does no company work that way, but the Army doesn't work that way either. Um, every, people need to feel good about what they do, and they need to feel they have control over what they do, and they need to feel like their ideas are heard. And so you don't just get everything you want. And so if you have a group of people who really think that they're making a giant-ass controller, and that's an amazing thing, and it's incredible. Sometimes you can't just shut them down. You have to let them run into a wall. Um, and then, and while they're doing that, you just take the sh- and, and that's what happened there. All right. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, use this um, moment here. So look, we know competition is a good thing. It brings out the best of the best here in the industry. It forces others to change. And, and sometimes that pressure that's being exerted can create something special. You know, for example, when, um, when talking to people, uh, I tell them that I love the iPhone and what the iPad have done. Cause, because without them, I wouldn't have had Windows Phone. I wouldn't have had Surface. And I really like to think that Xbox had an impact on the competition. So did you ever think that console gaming would ever reach this point where we're um, at today? Oh, I, I would have been totally shocked if it didn't reach the point that we're at today. And... Um, and yeah, you know, the, the, the fact is that, um, but look, so the, the, okay, the, I'll tell you the story. This is interesting. So the, this is interesting as opposed to all the shit that I said, which is not that interesting. This is actually interesting. Um, so the, the first ever live satellite TV interview I did for Xbox was at E3 in like maybe 2000, like the year before launch. And yeah, I think it was CNN. And the way these things work, it's totally terrifying. There's a guy with a camera, you know, in one of those, like, camera guy vests on. Yeah. And 
there's a producer, and it's typically uh, a, a, a younger woman or a guy with a with a clipboard and a microphone, um, and the person interviewing you is in New York or in Atlanta. Okay, it's the person interviewing isn't the person standing in front of you, and you have a little earpiece in and a camera lens right in your face, right? And you know the PR people said, okay, you do this interview. It's V three. Um, we had just announced that we were doing a game console, and the producer said, this is going to be great. We're just going to, it's like a fluff piece. We're just going to talk a little bit about, you know, games and Microsoft and games. And I was like, great, okay, cool. So the camera goes on me. And if you recall, uh, at that time, Microsoft was under investigation in the middle of a lawsuit with the Department of Justice for monopolies, right? Right. Um, and... So the anchor person introduces herself and says, okay, we're in commercial. We'll be on in a second. And they're like, three, two, one, bang. And it's like, hi, you know, you know welcome back to such and such on CNN. I'm so-and-so. I'm here with, uh, with Seamus Blackley, who is in charge of Microsoft's new game, co- new game console effort at the Electronic Entertainment Expo, a trade show for video games. Mr. Blackley, Microsoft is under investigation and involved in litigation with the Department of Justice. Wow. <laughs> Why does Microsoft feel it also needs to establish a monopoly in games? Bang. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, I, you know, and I did okay because what I said was, well, I said, actually, you know, if, if you spend a second and understand the game industry, you'll understand that the, that the dominant player or monopoly player in the game industry is Sony Computer Entertainment, which has had no competition and has had free reign to you know, do whatever they would like. Mm. Um, and I, if you ask around the game industry, you'll find that people are incredibly excited to have another, uh, another credible large player who can make the playing field more even for everyone. Wow. And, and that was the situation at the time. And, you know, and really, you know, Sony did get into a situation in which their tools were really impossible to use. The technology was very arcane. There were only a few developers who could actually use it. And I think if you go back to, to look at that, you can see that's the case. Um, third-party developers really had no chance of getting the same kinds of performance or even information that first-party developers did. And there was no information, there was no tools there is no sort of inclusive program for indies. The concept of indies didn't even really exist. And so of all the things that, you know, I think we are all proud of, the people who work on the original Xbox, it was really leveling that playing field and starting to take independent developers seriously, taking tools seriously, taking our obligations seriously to enable people to make games. Because the better games you have on a platform, the more successful that platform is going to be. And at the end of the day, that really is the Microsoft philosophy, and it really, really was. I mean, all bullshit aside and corporate crap aside, the basic philosophy of Windows really was, if we make this better, then the best programs will run on Windows, and Windows will be the dominant operating system. That was the guiding principle, you know, starting in the 80s for Windows. Mm. And a lot of the reason Xbox made sense for Microsoft was because that same philosophy applied to Xbox. If we make great hardware with the best tools, then it'll have the best games, and we'll have the best business. And do you feel in part responsible for like the impressive innovations that we see now in the industry? If you knew me, you would you would laugh if I take credit <laughs> for anything like that. But you know, I I do think that it's cool that Sony now has a huge developer support network, as does Nintendo. That's all these tools. There are programs for independent developers and all that stuff. And I I really feel that we were responsible for starting that. Mm. I really do. Um, and I think that's a great thing. And it comes from competition, which is what you brought up. It comes from seeing somebody else doing something that's being an advantage in their business, and you need to do it too. And then the whole industry changes. And now, you know, now we have most great new game ideas coming from outside of the first parties. Right. Uh, and I think that's really cool. Indeed. Yeah. Industry has definitely so, come a long way um, based on you know, where we are then, I think about the, the Ethernet port and the internal um, hard drive that was in the original Xbox and things. And now I look at where we are today and kind of like everyone has hopped on that boat because, you know, I think PS2 GameCube had memory cards, you know, and mm-hmm. Xbox, OG Xbox was definitely ahead of its time. It's a very impressive console. You guys did a great job with it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. We tried Xbox. hard. Oh, good. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's just it's it's yeah, you know, it's cool. I'm, I'm, I, it's good that you can see that in retrospect. You know, at the time when you try to do something innovative, um, you know, you really don't get much support. You have people who 
think it might work, who don't want it to work because they're competitors or because they're jealous. You have people who don't get the fact that you're trying to change things, and so they try to shoot you down. And then you have people who want to keep the status quo the way it is who try to shut you down. Right. Uh, it can be very difficult. Mm. <laughs> And a slightly lighter question here. I mean, speaking of the original Xbox, I mean, so one of the best aspects of that thing was just the software. Like, some of the software was some of the best games I remember playing. I remember, the one game I remember playing more than anything else is probably Fusion Frenzy in particular. <laughs> and so I guess out, out of the entire OG lineup Man, of that, Xbox that, games, that what was your particular like, favorite? That thing where you're running up the spiral ramp and those logs are coming out of the middle of it and pushing you off, that just made me crazy. <laughs> 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 oh. um, what was your question? I'm sorry. Oh, oh so it was, was a out of that entire lineup. Nostalgia attack of epic proportion based on that goddamn game. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, my question was out of that entire lineup, what was probably your favorite? Of the original lineup? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. You know, um, Again, I mean, I, I don't mean to bore you guys, um, uh, but you have no choice because you let me talk, so you're <laughs> fucked. Um, the, you know, at the time, uh, and, and again, this is going to sound crazy, but at the time, uh, nobody thought shooters would ever work on the console. Right. There Thanks. was, there was, there was like a, a huge group of people who said, without a PC, without a mouse and a PC and a screen sitting in front of you, you know, nobody could ever be competitive and there could never be a good shooter, blah, 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 right? And that was another thing we took so much shit about, just constantly. And I remember when the first builds of Halo got up and, uh, you know, we had various cobbled together bits of Xbox hardware. And I remember sitting on a concrete floor uh, in some, like, hotel room that was half finished because we had to stay there and booting up one of the first Halo levels that was actually working and have it really work with a controller and play a shooter on a console. Uh, and it was so sweet. It was like such an amazing thing. Um, and uh, I think I, I I may have stuck that development kit into a suitcase and still have it with that build on it. Nice. Did, uh, I know at one point when it was early on, um, Halo was intended for Mac, correct? Uh, very early on, yeah. That was around the time that Ed Freeze bought Bungie. Hmm. And and um, that that one was third person. Am I right? So oh, I have no idea about that. I remember that there was a really funny animation as a as a Christmas card. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was I was only asking just because I, I wanted to. I, I was intrigued. I wanted to know straight from you if if um, you made that into a first party or not first party like a first person shooter because you guys no, were getting no shit about fact, we, we, we were the platform guys I mean, look I, I made ed freeze and the games group lives hell they had a pretty nice gig going making pc games right they had flight simulator they had got bungie over from macintosh to pc and they were going to do all sorts of pc games and they were making windows games and here come these dickheads from the windows team who want to make a console and now it's got to make console games, and they got to figure that <laughs> out. And it was like just like ah, and it was like a lot of angst bring, about bringing Halo to console because it's like we just got them off Macintosh and PC, and now you want them on console? Like screw you! Oh my God, what are we gonna do? And it, you know there was much angst, but uh, you know obviously uh, it worked out pretty well. Um, It'd be interesting, you know, one of the guys who I, I hang out with here uh, in L.A. is uh, um, one of the, the two founders of Bungie. There's Jason, uh, who stayed at Microsoft, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, then, and then, then this, this guy who came to, to Pasadena. So if after <laughs> this you want to hook up with him and talk about the history of Bungie, uh, he's a super, super great guy to talk to. Awesome. We'll definitely look into that. That's 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 um I loved Xbox, OG Xbox, Knights of the Old Republic, I thought was an amazing game. That's one of the few titles where, you know, you're bringing over those PC type games to the console and really introduced me to what what was on PC, something I've never imagined playing on. And to this day, I don't play on PC. I'm a console gamer. But bringing those games from PC to console, I think that was a huge stepping stone. Yeah, but again, you know, it, it, it was. And it was not without peril because, uh, you know, like I said, people were very dubious about 
uh, about whether or not PC games could ever work on a console because there was there was seen to be something very special about the PC, the higher resolution and uh, you know not in the living room. And you also have to remember, I think it's hard as a, as a modern human to remember that you know that there was an NTSC resolution PC of probably fairly low quality in most living rooms right. uh, around 2001. Right. And so, you know, as compared to computer displays at the time, it was laughable, mm. totally laughable. And so people thought they really had a point. Like, how could you possibly make, you know, a great shooter game with those giant pixels the size of quarters, you know? <laughs> um, you know, and there's kind of a point. that What they didn't realize was that, um, that you could, because you had lower resolution, you could put a lot more thought, a lot more graphics horsepower into all those pixels and smooth them out and filter them and make it look super cherry. Mm. And, uh, you know, I remember the first time seeing Microsoft's football game and then seeing Madden on, on our platform. Oh, my God. And how, am- and how amazing it looked compared to anything else anybody had ever seen because it was like a modern graphics hardware brought to the TV screen. And make no mistake, man, you know, I, I love Sony, but the PlayStation 2 did not have a modern graphics architecture. It, it had a, a sort of a semi-amateur hour, Japanese engineers having their first go at making a 3D engine kind of a graphics architecture. Um, and it was innovative in a lot of ways, but the, the, the weapon we brought to bear on Xbox was a mature graphics architecture from like really good engineers who've been doing it their whole career with a lot of experience. And it was just a sweet part. It was just a way better part. And so the graphics we drew on Xbox just looked great. And and that was a huge advantage. So uh, I, just to switch things up here a little bit um, and touch about uh, on the previous topic, um, I wanted to bring back the the the, the topic of the Duke controller because uh, it, it's in part due to what you've done. To, I, just, you know, I can't I just can't get away from it, can I? I just <laughs> you can't. Uh, it's, it's a revolving like, door. It's gonna come back to you, man. I'm For Halloween, like, I'm, gonna I'm gonna dress I'm gonna be, up as a Duke controller. Gonna, they're going to be lowering me into the ground and like everybody's going to be standing around like par- partying or crying or whatever. Or throwing and somebody's going to run and go, but the Duke! <laughs> but the Duke! Oh, man, if I, if I bring a Duke controller to E3, will you, will you, can you please sign that for me, man? Please. I will just sign it or I will stomp on it. One of the two. <laughs> <laughs> Why not both? Um, so look, the, you fan, you, what is it? You fan the flame here when it came to, um, talking about a duke remake we we know that you've talked about it uh and gamers they're all they're all for it they want to see that uh, come to the xbox one um uh if given an opportunity would you make a duke controller for the xbox and or the scorpio so 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 this i'm gonna i'm gonna answer the question that you didn't ask but you have asked yeah (laughs) or one bund um (laughs) i uh I, I got the idea actually from uh, from a guy uh, uh, on Twitter who said, you know, they you should reissue the Duke or some crazy thing, and and people were asking about it, and I was, you know, talking about how widely I'd been mocked for it and sort of what the history was, and then, uh, like I said, you know, would any, you know, who would who would want that in the semi derisively, and I got like two hundred thousand responses to that. Yeah, people were like yeah. so excited about Duke. And, you know, like, uh, I got so beat up at the time over it by, you know, a group of people who were accustomed to the size of the PlayStation Nintendo controllers that I lost track of the fact that once they got the thing, they loved it, right? Mm -hmm. And I ended up, like, I ended up insulting people who loved something, which is also not cool. (laughs) Like, I was not, I was not awake to the fact that, you know, people really loved it and it was a, and it was a big deal. Um, and, uh, and when I saw that, I was, you know, somewhat inspired. And so I, I literally jokingly said to Phil, like, you know, we, Hey, we should totally do that. And, um, you know, I don't have much to report that I can talk about right now, but, um, if there is a way to make it happen, it's going to happen. It really is. All right. Answering questions, not having to ask them. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So well, a little more going into the future or even more of like a present question, um, what do you think overall about the position Xbox is in with the Xbox One and Scorpio on the horizon? What do you think about this position that Microsoft's in in particular? Well, I think it's hard. I mean, look, you know, this is the this is gonna be the first missed console cycle since the beginning of consoles, right? Um, 
And by mist, I mean Scorpio is not really a new device. It's sort of a one. It's a you know seven point five or five point five, wherever you you know are counting from, right? Right. And you know PlayStation's doing the same thing, and I think Nintendo just released the- an, like a half in, in, incremental product, also, mm-hmm. right? Um, which, by the way, by the way, what do you guys think of Switch? Oh, oh. man, I liked it. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like the I'm- Nintendo has this ability to to release products that are just goddamn fun, right? <laughs> and and like, yeah, I mean, just pure guilt-free fun. It's like a trip to Disneyland. Like, who could not love it? Yeah. Um, it's really interesting, and, and, but it's also you know, but Nintendo's not really released a major console in a long time. It's all it's like it's like a strange thing if you look at it historically. But I think it makes a lot of sense. So if we look at the the situation through that lens and the the way that consumers' expectations have changed, um, I think you can understand you know where Scorpio fits in better because uh, people have changed from a mentality of waiting for big releases uh, and this is not only for consoles, but for games as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And instead, having tons of incremental updates. Um, If we look at, you know, the social trends and the consumer trends behind, like, Gabe's um, decision to release alphas and betas on Steam, you know, Gabe did that because of fan feedback. I'm sorry, Valve Valve did that. Mm -hmm. It's not just Gabe being a dictator, (laughs) but Valve did that. Um, although Gabe is a dictator. Gabe, you're a dictator, I know it. Um, <laughs> uh, he, uh, um, no, they, but they, it's, a very, it's a very smart thing to do because the relationship between developers and, and the audience is getting closer. And so the number of touch points there, and I sound like a marketing asshole now, but it's true, <laughs> like the amount of communication you can have with developers is so much higher than it ever has been. And so there's a sort of a continuum now of interaction between uh, consoles and, and game developers and gamers and marketing people and distributors and everybody else. And so this idea of there being a schedule of major releases has kind of fallen apart. And this has now extended into hardware as well. Mm. Um, you know, and, and there's a pressure on the hardware, which is that it's super expensive and difficult and a huge risk to release a hardware platform because there's a huge upfront cost. Right. Uh, non-recoverable expense in in, in developing all that technology, if it doesn't work, you lose all that money. And it's extremely hard to convince boards of directors and investors and shareholders that that's a good idea. But you can take little bites out of it. If you can treat the hardware, if you can, if you can move the hardware sort of in the direction that software has moved, sort of hardware as a service, then uh, it gets a little easier. And so I think this is the move that Sony and Microsoft have done. Um, but I think Microsoft is a little bit better approach than Sony, and I think they're lucky uh, because their company maybe understands these trends a little bit more. Mm-hmm. You know, Sony is a is a big a big Japanese company that has a lot of consumer electronics experience, but the consumer electronics experience that Sony has isn't so much about an intimate relationship with customers. Microsoft has had, for better or worse, an intimate direct relationship with all of its customers for Windows for decades, and so it changes the philosophy of the company pretty substantially. It's built into the DNA of the place, and so Phil had an opportunity to make a relatively substantial update to the hardware platform and to use that to give himself an excuse to spend <laughs> a lot of money on games, which, which, which is really important. No, and, and look, when you're running a division of a company like that, mm-hmm. you got to do that. Right. I mean, because like, when, when we were launching Xbox, okay, I would go to these, these meetings, like with, 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 with Robbie Bach and these guys, mm-hmm. and we would sit and have to talk about Xbox P&L. And the guy next to us would be, like, would be, uh, um, uh, who was it at that time? I think it was John Devon, who ran Office. And so he would go, and then we would go in. And Office, at that point, was the most profitable business in the history of mankind. Mm. No, full stop. Right. And we were saying, yeah, we're going to lose maybe $4 billion before we launch. Wow. And like, that sucks. Like the, you, it's not easy to then on the heels of that say, and could we have $50 million to buy two Japanese exclusives? No, God damn. Well, you're going to sink the company. Right. Um, and so by saying, Hey, we're going to save a bunch of money by doing like a sort of an incremental hardware release. It gives you the opportunity to spend that money on content. And I think that's a big part of it. Mm. I could be wrong. Bill could be laughing at me, but I think that's part of it. <laughs> that's a hey i'll tell you right now that is something i've never thought about i don't think anybody's thought about that concept 
that's actually a, a, a an amazing thought. Like just to actually think about that, releasing incremental hardware to put more money into software. And you look at services, Xbox Game Pass, which I just think is just genius. I really do think that's genius. As a parent and, and someone who used to work in retail, if I go to someone and I tell them, listen, I'm, I can get you this console, the Xbox One S for $249 or maybe lower by holiday season. And for $10 a month, you can have access to over 100 games for 10 bucks a month. That's an amazing incentive. And, it, and, it, and you're right. You're starting to see these companies go into the, the software as a service. PS Now, Game Pass, EA Access. Um, and it's just... A, a big transition that some of us dinosaurs who love playing on, on consoles have to get used to. I'm not a fan of exclusives going to PC, but I understand what Microsoft is trying to do and how that benefits them software wise. So it's really is is really well, no, provoking. It's, and it's uh you know the the software the service thing is great too also because it's gonna put yourself in like Phil's position at like asking for like tens of millions of dollars to make games. If you're going to spend 35 or 40 million bucks to make a big game, and I'm not going to mention any games because people are so sore about some of the cancellations. Right. But uh, um, it, that's really hard. But if, you, if you're asking for that much money and you have this constant revenue stream of subscriptions and you say, yeah, but we're making $10 million a week, mm. suddenly it seems like a good bet. And so it really changes the dynamic of how the business goes. It changes from a really risky hits dependent business where if you don't hit this thing, you're going to lose 30 million bucks Right. to a business that you can manage, right? Because you have, you have income coming in all the time. And so you can make decisions about what's reasonable to spend based on how much income you have coming in. And so it, it really helps. And, but the flip side of it is that from the consumer standpoint, you know, we all want I I want big releases, man. You know, I'm like, <laughs> uh, you know, I I was so excited for like Horizon Zero Hour that I was gonna I was gonna barf, right? Right. And um and and so like you you crave that, but you also have to understand that that's like a hundred million dollar bet by Sony, and you know, damn. And not only that, but you know, I mean, Gorilla is a great developer, but there were definitely times when the game wasn't looking so great, and it took a huge amount of balls for those guys to stick with that game. Right. You know, Shu is the man. I mean, he is like, <laughs> like you, you talk about competition being good. You guys as Xbox gamers owe a huge debt of gratitude to yoshi because he is a f***ing badass. Mm. And he is pushing, 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 and he's also a gamer. Like, you put Shu and yoshi in the same room, they will play any game together and be good at it and know about it and know the history of it and love it. Mm. And we, like the whole game industry, owes a lot to those two guys because they're real gamers really running the business. Um, but, you know, it's a, it takes balls to take those bets. And so the decisions people make to distribute revenue makes it easier for them, but makes it weirder for us because it means you see all these little incremental releases and lots of DLC and when is the next big thing coming, when's the update, and it becomes all about features and it gets, I, it gets exhausting for me to keep track of it all and to remember like what's coming out when and you know what's what, and you know I'll be I'll be hanging out playing something and my son will come in and say, well why don't you have the DLC? Like are you dinosaur? Like you need to get this and this. And I don't have any clue because like, as an old man I'm used to like when is the next thing coming out, right? And that's what I get excited yeah. about. Hmm. You know, do you think we're going to see more um, investments going that way, or are we going to see less uh, investments towards those big titles? Is, it, is that going to be like a trend? Um, I, uh, it's hard to say. I, I, you know, I want to say we'll see big investments, but I kind of, I, 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 you know, my my rational brain tells me that if Sony Microsoft is successful with these 1.5 updates or the 0.5 updates, mm -hmm. that we're going to see fewer big releases. Good. We're gonna see the revenue, you know, spread out more. Wow. Okay. I see. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking that it's gonna. I, I like to think that we see less big releases because they're allowing to give their partners, that you know, third-party developers, uh, some breathing room to launch their games. You know, because sometimes whenever they have all these titles crammed in, um, I'm just buying first-party games. I don't even look well, at third party. But but that's not entirely true. I think that the, the, the data suggests, at least the data that I used to look at when I was really in the middle of this business, suggests that the more good games there are, the more consumers will spend flat out. So nobody's getting lost if they're releasing quality stuff. Right. Um, you know, that's true. And, and that's certainly true for me, man. You know, and like, 
that's how you can tell you're a gamer where like, you know, you're like, well, maybe I'm not going to be able to have dinner tomorrow night, but I'm buying this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gaming know? on a budget. I'm a college student. Yeah, but, you know, that's like, that's, that's like, you know, that's what it's about. Like, to be deadly honest, man, that's what it's about. I would rather play a game than eat. Absolutely. And, uh, (laughs) well, with virtual reality coming, you could eat. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Very low calorie, too. Um, (laughs) but, uh, you know, the, the, the thing is that that's never really been the problem. The problem is when there's not enough good content not enough good games to sustain the business. And so to some extent, anything that makes it possible for everybody to continue to invest in developers making like better and better products is good. Even if it's inconvenient or it's like these 0.5s or 0.25s or whatever, and it sort of spreads things out. Um, the trick is you don't want that to become an excuse for people to not invest in big new franchises because that's equally death for the industry. And I have a question for you guys. So Phil's taking a lot of heat a lot of first party cancellations and there's one that was very near and dear to my heart that got canceled which i shall not name but you can probably guess <laughs> um what do you guys think of that like where what what are, what are people saying about that i mean is it or you know it was a big freak out a few weeks ago i remember it was brutal i remember i probably was the first person to tweet phil because it was very quiet i'm sure other people did but I, he responded to me i remember him being my question being the first person, uh, the, uh, the first one he responded to. And um, I was disappointed as well because I'm a big JRPG fan. I'm a big RPG fan. Like all the games okay. on OG so Xbox. We're disappointed was about the same thing. Okay. Uh, you know, so <laughs> basically everybody, I, I literally had 2,000 tweets of people just killing him about his response, which was that um, he was disappointed in that, that scale bound wound up getting canceled. But he felt it was the best thing to do for the Xbox gamer. And no one truly understood what he was saying. Everybody just was in their feelings. It was a very emotional time. Everybody was just killing him. Because a game like Scalebound is not something you get on Xbox because of the relationship that Microsoft has with some Japanese developers. The console doesn't sell well in Japan. So that was very unique. It was different. And a lot of people were disappointed that it, it wound up getting canceled out. But after hearing him on Unlocked and him talking about sometimes you have to get some of the the things that you're working on out of the way, you know, maybe a game like Fable uh, Legends that they were working on and scale bound and stuff in order to bring in new stuff, new content or new studios and stuff like that. I, I think a lot of people didn't catch that. That kind of went over their heads, but I did. So I'm really looking forward to E3 and seeing how they recoup. Well, I mean, look, and also, I mean, you, you, you got to put yourself in Phil's position, and this is true for Shu too. It's even true for Nintendo. Um, you know, if Scalebound was going to fail and it wasn't looking good and builds were not getting better, then that's Phil's credibility. So if Phil says, no, we're not canceling it, right? Right. Then the Microsoft executives and the board of directors and people looking over his shoulder because he has a lot of bosses, right? Right. Now, now he's f***ed on credibility, Right. If it keeps on not working out, then all the other stuff he believes in that he's trying to keep alive, he loses his ability to do that too. Mm. He loses his ability to identify new developers with new concepts and get those funded. Right. Um, and that is really what he was saying on Unlocked. He was, I mean, he was in a, in a coded way. He can't say that. Right. But, you know, by, by making room, what he was saying is, you know, it's like what I was saying about the controller. Even if you're the boss, you have a certain amount of political capital you can spend. Okay? And if you have this huge failure and you're just you're covering and you're covering and you're covering it, eventually you lose credit you're gonna lose credibility with the people who matter who are giving you the dough and you're gonna lose the ability to keep the entire thing together. I'm not suggesting that Phil's gonna lose it. All I'm saying is that, you know, the cancellation has you know, it, it has a little bit to do with how much you love a game. It has a little bit to do with how much you believe in the people and the developer. It has a little bit to do with how well their team is performing. It has a little bit to do with how well your business is doing. It has a little bit to do with what other games are going to come at around the same time. It has a little bit to do with whether or not this game is slipping into a time when you're not going to be able to launch it successfully. And it has a little bit to do with whether or not there's better looking stuff that you're seeing new from other developers that's similar or that might be even better. So you got all these things you're balancing all the time. Right. And, it, and it's really mm-hmm. hard. And, and the thing, the other thing about the, you know, today's world is that we have so much information 
like I feel like I can I can like close my eyes and see what Scalebound is like to play right now, even though it's canceled and never gonna happen. Right? But I saw enough, but I have in my imagination. I, I had my imagination for what it's gonna be like, and I don't want to let go of that. So when Phil says it's canceled, I'm gonna you know I, I hate him. Right. <laughs> I, I hate him. Right. <laughs> and it's not, you know, it's not uh, a I, rational. It's not a rational response, and I should know better. I've been in that position, but I still do. Mm. You know, and I think that it's a reason, really reasonable thing. It's hard to manage. Yeah. You know, and, to, and to touch up on what you said near the beginning, you know, uh, a bad game is bad forever. Like, you know, you, you got to launch it right. And, and if he pushed out that game, he possibly could have been terrible and just bad for the developer, bad for Phil's reputation, uh, bad for yeah. Xbox and, reputation. And, 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 and that's true. And, and a late game is only late till it ships. And, you know. I can think of a couple examples. Unfortunately, they're both Sony examples for you guys, but they're good. <laughs> um, Horizon is one, right? right? And they stuck with it, and it worked out. Um, uh, 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 Guardian is another one, and they stuck with it, and it worked out. Right. Okay. And Guardian may not make a shit ton of money, but it's really good for the PlayStation brand. It's this beautiful, beautiful thing that they can show as being a centerpiece of what they're about, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, it's fan capital. That's like, hey, a you, bad, you stuck a, with a what bad you example, mm-hmm. right? And that, but on the other hand, when you back shit like No Man's Sky, right? Mm-hmm. Then, then, then that that game is bad forever. Although I hear it's been patched, but I was so burned by it that I, I probably won't go back to it. I won't go back to it, right? Right. And I was like super excited. I was like defending that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did the first son, year. My, my one son would just like turn around and be like, wouldn't even talk to me. Oh wow! Because. Uh, because I was playing No Man's Sky, he's like, "Oh, really? You're you're playing No Man's Stupid? Are you are you are you No Man's Retarded? That's your problem." No I, I feel like your home is a hostile environment. You're being bullied in your own home. It's what so does he true. take your lunch? I, I need you to. Yeah, you you really need to amplify that message online to help me out. <laughs> you're gonna have to pay a toll to use the bathroom. That's funny. No, I have a. I I, I have I have. Uh, three sons and they are outspoken gamers who know what they're talking about and uh, and nothing could be better right because like we can sit down and have like a hardcore discussion and they won't back down they like know exactly what what they like and it, it's you know it, it's it's the great thing about gamers in general I mean whether or not they're your sons or, or not it's like no matter what background you come from like you know you can be like the biggest you know, deplorable Trump head in the universe, and you can literally spend eight hours online playing against like the most liberal snowflake and have a fucking awesome time, and nothing matters, right? <laughs> it's that yeah. place, and that's what's so special about it, and that's why we're all here, right? It's like, I mean, what else is there like that? So, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm lucky to have that in my home, but you know, <laughs> Phil and and those guys are not lucky to have to navigate that because you know the passions run hot and. You know, and they really have no safe place because when they have to make those hard decisions, the fans roast them. And while they're making those decisions the hard time, the whole time, you know, the guys who are who are expecting them to run a responsible business are roasting them too, uh, and it's a hard thing. And then you know, you have the competitive aspect within the platforms, and it's weird because it's C rise thing. Like when when PlayStation does well from a numbers standpoint, a business standpoint. Uh, Nintendo and, and, and Xbox do do better also. Mm. Uh, do you guys know the old adage about, you know, the best thing you can do for a bar is to have a bar open up next to it? No, I've never heard that. Yeah. I haven't heard that before. Yes, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a true thing. It's too bad at restaurants as well. Um, and, and it's definitely true for consoles. Like every big release that somebody does exclusive or not brings everybody else up because it makes the industry healthier, reminds people to play games. And if your fans are pissed off because there's some exclusive, it's an opportunity for you to, to pop an exclusive in and get that going too. And, you know, and then the, the sad fact of it is, and it's probably true for all of us, like, like, you know, ha- has there ever really been a time when you didn't own all the major consoles anyway? Right. right. Um, and, yeah. and, and that, that's the reality of it. Gotcha. Well, that, with these 0.5 increment incrementations, I guess, uh, I, I think that'll be le- That'll happen less. That's just me guessing. Um, you might but, be right. That's that's an interesting that's an interesting thing to talk about. It's like, you know, when does your living room look like you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, an Arkansas front yard with forty rusted cars parked in it? Um, <laughs> you know, because you'd have so much hardware. Right, right. Yeah. Over time, definitely. No offense to no no offense to Arkansas, which is a lovely state. And has many <laughs> <good cars. laughs> 
Seamus, man, I I am just blown away with all the knowledge you've given us today. I, I've had I've had a lot of fun. I really have. It may have been boring for you, but for me, this was like really great to learn so much and get the information and really get your opinion on the industry. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thanks, man. Um, what I wanted to talk about, though, was that it seems since the beginning of the Xbox era, the console has never done well in Japan. Um, I've heard so many bad things it about... It seems. You mean it just is the case? <laughs> it just, it just is like... the case. Um, you know, I, I heard so many bad stories about when you guys first introduced the OG Xbox over there, people were saying that they didn't want it to be called Xbox because X meant death and it was big and it wasn't appealing. Oh, it mean, doesn't mean death. Like, so in Japan, like, let's say that you are like your girlfriend is like down the street mm -hmm. and you sent her to go see if there's like a table at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in America, She'd probably, if there wasn't a table, she'd probably like wave her hand up or shake her head back and forth right now. Mm -hmm. um, in Japan, she'd hold her arms up crossed in an X to mean no. Mm. And so that crossed X means no. And so people were that it was the no box. Oh. oh. Wow. I mean, but, you know, and, 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 and you know, in the proud tradition of like the Chevy Nova going to Mexico, that kind of thing. <laughs> gotcha. Where Nova means doesn't go. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It just it lets you know that that language barrier, it's important, I guess you can say, if you don't, especially when you're trying to appeal to the Japanese in that Eastern market. Um, and, and it just brings up my question. How can Microsoft and Xbox appeal to the East and not be neglected by Japanese devs? I, I think about Sony sometimes and how many games they may get, even if they're not exclusive, but the abundance of games just not going on Xbox because it doesn't sell well. Do you think that they can turn that around, making maybe a, a more appealing console that is more sleek to appeal to the West? I mean, to appeal to the East. Well, it's a little, it's a weird thing, cultural, cultural stuff. You know, like, I mean, you know, you have to ask yourself why, like, David Hasselhoff is a huge star in Germany, right? Mm, right. Um, and and here, he's not. I mean, you know, people make fun of him. Um, and that you know that that's true of like everything of all all different kinds of content. Um, the uh, and and by the way, one of the most hilarious things is how David Hasselhoff is like he's a sharp guy, and he understands that and mocks himself for it, which is super hilarious. <laughs> um, but you know there are games like Japan is the, the Japanese consumers are like the PhD consumers of the world. <laughs> like they know everything about every product. They select things very carefully. There's a culture of like you know you, you're. If you don't know everything about the thing you're buying, then you're shunned by your friends like you're an idiot. Mm. And they're very specific about things, and they're used to a very high level of service and quality. And so if you can sell things to Japanese consumers, it, it's, it's, it really is like the, the pinnacle of your sales career um, to be able to do that. Um, and in addition to that, there's this, there are specific types of game and movie content and TV content that do well in Japan that, that nobody else will consume. I mean, some of their Asian countries maybe, and maybe some, you know, outlying flukes like Brazil and places where there are big Japanese populations. But, you know, there are entire types of games and I'm not, I'm just not, I'm not like sort of only talking about the games where you're like, you know, collecting schoolgirl panties and stuff. <laughs> Although those are, but, but those are really popular. I mean, right. Weird hentai games. And those don't fly anywhere else, but they make really good money in Japan still. Right. Um, and, you know, it's culturally hard to understand that for us. It really is. Um, but there are also role-playing games and super deep, like, vampire games and stuff that are really popular in Japan that just don't go anywhere else. And it's related to the thing, like, you know, in some fighting games, it'll, like, show the character and it'll give, like, their blood type and stuff. And you're like, why do I care about their blood <laughs> right, type? Right, right. But to Japanese players, this matters because this way to connect. Wow, um, and it has to do with storytelling traditions, Japan, everything else. So I'm I'm going on and on and on because I'm giving you an actual answer to this. So mm -hmm. um, I apologize for being a totally f insufferable pedant, but you just have to listen. No, it's not a problem. So, <laughs> okay, so oh, there are games uh, that are Japanese that, wow. for reasons Japanese developers don't understand, do hugely well in America. Mm -hmm. And you have to realize that a lot of the times it's a big surprise that some of these franchises that maybe don't even do that well in Japan become huge hits in America. 
Hmm. Um, and I'm not really on top of it, but I know for a fact that if you look at like Ghost in the Shell or, um, you know, uh, that was uh, awesome. Um, let me think of, I'm trying to remember which franchise it actually is. Maybe the, the like Final Fantasy, maybe, God, what was it? But the, some big Japanese game franchises didn't even really start that strong in Japan and then really took off in the U.S. and in Europe, and that helped them in Japan again because things that are cool in America tend to seem really cool from Japan also. Mm. So there are these, these things that no one really understands about why some content will cross over in that direction. But the corollary of that is that there are almost no games that are American games that translate well to Japan. Right. And there have been a few, and one of them is Crash Bandicoot, that have translated well. But Crash Bandicoot was, was engineered intentionally by, by Jason Rubin and the Naughty Dog crew at that point to do well in Japan with advice from Japanese developers. Hmm. Um, you know, like Metroid Prime, the one that was made in Texas. You know, there are a bunch of guys from Nintendo down there trying to work on that so it would do well in Japan, putting things in it to make Japanese people, you know, able to connect with it. So, you know, really there's a, you know, I now understand having lived in Japan and tried to, you know, tried to launch it there. And I almost, uh, when, I, when I resigned from Microsoft, one of the things they offered to stop me from resigning was to go there and, and, and you know, run a group over there. Um, I, I understand now that you would almost need to engineer an entirely different product specifically for the Japanese market. And that would really give away a lot of the strengths that the box would have for the U S and the Western markets. Mm. And I, I think it's a very, it's a very difficult position to be in because you have a situation in which you can make a product for Japanese consumers designed by Japanese designers living and breathing in that culture. And that product can do well elsewhere. It's the like same reason that, like, you know, guys in guys in, in in Texas can get super excited about you know the new Skyline car, right. supercar, right? Because it's awesome looking and it's like super powerful and all that stuff. But guys in Yokohama are never going to get excited about a Camaro, right? And and that's just how it is. I mean, I'm not saying all guys. There are some amazing U.S. car enthusiasts in Japan, but overall, culturally there seems to be like a one-way flow there hmm. um, where Japan cool stuff can become fetishist in, in America and in Europe. It's much harder to go the other direction. Right. And you know what? Why not, why not just be psyched about that? Like I love Japanese stuff, getting Japanese stuff. And if we can have a big business making Western games and, and, and they mostly don't work in Japan. Okay. Right. That's okay. Right. That's fine. I think that Microsoft does well, or at least Phil is attempting. He recently went out to Japan to uh, have conversations with some of the third parties. I don't know what obviously happened out there. I hope that it was it went positive because there's some games that you know may not have hit the platform that actually may have sequels, like the Kingdom Hearts series. Kingdom Hearts three will be on Xbox One, but one point eight and I think uh two point eight or whatever it is won't be, which is the the remastered pr uh, prequels to the first the first two games that released on PlayStation. So King Kingdom Hearts is a great idea is a great example of a property that can cross that barrier really well. Um, mm -hmm. that's like a super good and it's also those are great games. The whole series has been really well made, right? Um, right. You know, who like Square, I mean damn. You know, damn. Um, but <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, Phil going there, I mean, I, I also get that. I mean, look, you know, the, one of the great things about gamers is how you can talk to any gamer anywhere in the world and get along and be friends in no time. It's right. even more so for game developers, dude. Like, it's like this, this, this international fraternity. And going and talking to people in different cultures who make games and seeing how they do it and what their take is, is amazing. And, you know, uh, if I was Phil, I would also be going to Japan a lot and seeing what talent there was there and seeing who was frustrated working for Sony Nintendo, right? I mean, you know, everybody gets frustrated in a relationship eventually. And, you know, who could you get? Who could you get to work on, on games? Who, what are those, which of those guys would be interested in being successful in the West or working with Microsoft? And, that's um, that's something you know, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you just very quickly, before, you know, before we end everything. Before is it the possible? Last, last question? Well, I mean, this is it was the last question, but pertaining to what we're talking about, is it possible for Microsoft to build a studio in Japan? It's 
possible for sure. But you know, it, it I think it's just, it's very difficult because they would need to have a platform that's successful in Japan. It's just mm. not. Did you guys know that Microsoft had released a game console in Japan? In they the released. Uh, no, I, I didn't know like that in the eighties. <laughs> yeah, you, you should yeah look up the MSX. Look up the MSX. Not only was it released in Japan by a Japanese company, but it was also one of the world's first in-flight game systems on uh, Japanese airlines. Wow. True story. Check uh, it out. We definitely check it, check it out. Definitely check it out. See, that's where you get the exciting stuff made, the exciting, obscure electronics history sh- right here, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Seamus, you have been amazing. I am very grateful for you coming on the show, man. I I can't. I, I re- I'm really. Imp- I'm really feel knowledgeable about Xbox at this point. There's just so many things. No, seriously, because I'm a. We're an Xbox enthusiast group, and uh, we, you know we built our brand on Xbox, and from there we've expanded out. We have PlayStation shows in our network, and movie, TV, comic book shows in our network. We have our own website now that's doing extremely well. We're getting passes to E3, and we're doing all these things in like two and a half, almost three years time. And it all started with that one interview with Phil Spencer. It just changed everything, uh, the way we approached our podcast. And from there, we've had Greenberg on, Ken Lobb on, Jeff Keeley on. Um, uh, we had Mike Yabrera on. Like All these executives we've had on the show and really got a chance to pick their brains about what they're doing with Microsoft and Xbox and now having you on the show to get some perspective of the birth and how that console evolved into what it is today was just amazing. So thank you. I really appreciate you coming on and, and, you know, sharing some time with us and talking about Xbox. Well, it was super fun talking to you guys. Thank you very much. And I wish you every success. It's really uh, impressive what you've done so far. And uh, I can't wait to see what's next. Thank you. All right. Take care guys.